Thank you, Laura. Um, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge ANSA's contribution here and also the Commerce Commission for allowing us to collaborate. So, <laughs> um, it was really interesting uh, in the history of the Grasslands Conference, it was interesting uh, yesterday, we heard probably more papers focused on soils that we've heard for a long time. So I found that quite rewarding because soil is more than just fertilizer inputs, it's the chemical and biological attributes. So that was quite reassuring. And the consequences of poor soil management are quite profound. And we have been addressing that. And the presence of earthworms in rhizobia was also mentioned yesterday. I know Alec Mackay has been doing a bit of work on earthworms. So as an industry, we actually think about that and we've been focused on that. And it's good to see that starting to come to the fore again. The other thing, and if there's an upside to David Parker's um, 190 rule, is it's perhaps the conversations around clover are becoming more resurgent again, and it's good that it, it's uh, getting some attention again and getting more focus. But from the fertiliser program perspective, that philosophy has not changed over the last 30 years in any case. Our fertiliser programs and our basis of programs have been based around supporting the legumes. The fertility levels are set basically to ensure you have a strong legume basis in there. So the PKS and lime, et cetera, things haven't really changed to today. If you look at the what's been happening in terms of demand historically, you could probably put a flat line through there. And it was interesting contrasting that with Gerald Rise's paper yesterday around how biomass production in New Zealand's changed. And you can see that largely it's been pretty flat apart from political changes that have driven that. Interestingly enough, and you'll see this in the nitrogen curve next as well, the Clean Streams Accord came in about there. So you see the recognition and the adaption of our primary sector to, to that Clean Streams Accord, to the value of nutrients and effluent, and we saw that as a wee correction. I guess the most profound change, and I started at a time where dairy farms weren't using nitrogen, you can see the very strong ramp up in demand has happened largely there. You can see the Again, the plateauing around the time the Clean Streams Accord, so the industry self-management policies do really work. But that's largely growth been associated with dairy industry. Um, and of course, because the Kyoto year is set at 1990, it means there's a lot of emphasis and borax put onto that, particularly from Greenpeace and other NGOs. But it's something that's important to recognise that growth. The other big change is how we look at how we manage soil testing. Assuming you even did a soil test back there, typically you'd do two or three soil tests. I remember when I first started, one, <coughs> uh, one of our technical managers at Waikato said, oh, well, the easiest way to deal with FERT programs is, did the FERT farmer have a good production year last year? And if he did, just tell him to put the same on again. So we've moved beyond that a little bit more uh, from basic transects to what's becoming a lot more common now with the same farm looking at the spatial variability that's there. This is a Waikato farm that's relatively, visually relatively flat, but you can see there's huge variability, and that's the opportunity that we've seen transitioning over time and going forward is spatial management, uh, looking at the farm at finer and finer scale and trying to address uh, uh, opportunities. The other big change has been the introduction of soil end testing and migrating nitrogen management on farm from very much a rule of farm 10 to 1 response to actually starting to quantify responses. And Mark Shepard talked a wee bit about that yesterday. So the ability to actually be more disciplined uh, and um, defensible nitrogen use in terms of using some of these sorts of measures. But the consequence of the finer scale and he's bringing these other soil tests in, is you've actually got to be able to apply it. You know, the four R's, right product, right place, right rate. So you can develop all the software tools and all the widgets in the world, but you've actually got to physically get the product on the paddock at the right rate, uh, at, at the right place. And the compound with that is you've got to have products that can actually do that. And we have a real challenge with us in terms of getting products that are both chemically and physically compatible and quality that actually can sustain that and then making sure the spreaders are actually calibrated. And there is actually a cost to poor spreading, even in pastoral systems. This is some work that Russell Horrell did. And you can see that even in Waikato pastures with phosphorus and sulfur, typically a phosphorus CV target for our industry is a, a 30%. So you can see that there is an economic cost associated with, with uh, poor spreading. So 
there, there is a prize to be gained and a benefit to be gained that's real from actually focusing on doing that with precision. And the response to the industry has been adapting new technology to improve that. So variable rate technology, remote sensing, and finding out how we can actually look at landscapes and be more precise and do that, but have the technology to actually put it on spatially and actually achieve that. And then there's the context in which we operate. Gone from the uh, deregulated, permissive environment that we had in the 80s, the early 90s, to industry self-regulation, moving through to type input regulations in terms of Taupo, Lake Rotorua, uh, where we've seen N and P constraints, methane coming through, <coughs> food scares, to where we're getting through to now, where there's a tempering to we, potentially towards input regulation controls, which is something we don't like. But it's a new environment, and it's changing our focus, and therefore, the way we're responding is in terms of having to think about efficiencies. So we've moved from production to productivity, and that leads to some interesting um, innovations. So the context of these regional national plans has been very strongly advocating that we want output-based regulations where it happens. And the reason for that is it drives innovation. And the easiest analogy I use is, you know, your teenager would want to borrow the car and drive to Auckland. And, you, and in the past you'd say, there's $100 to get to Auckland and back, whereas now, although they'd probably spend it all at the top of Bombay Hills. But anyway, they, uh, whereas the change now is you might give them 50 litres of petrol to get there. And it changes the whole mindset in terms of how the industry thinks about the types of products and how they do that. And good examples of that is EcoN, which was a nitrification inhibitor, uh, Sustain, which is a urease inhibitor to reduce ammonia. So we've looked at that. The other issue is if we're trying to look at externalities on farm, how do we actually do that? And ultimately, you have to quantify that. And you either quantify it by measuring or modelling. And so the consequence of why we have a tool like Overseer and tools like that is we want to quantify. And it's and, and as flawed as it may be, it provides a way to quantify and make objective decisions. The other challenge <coughs> is the ramping up in staff from probably 20 staff 30 years ago to where there's probably close to 200 extension agents. And given the way plans and, and, and that are moving, it's a big challenge for us in going forward as to how do we resource and support the primary sector and growers in terms of that. And then how do we support our social license with things like the 4R program, right product, right rate, right place, right time, and trying to ensure that our footprint is as small as it possibly can be. So what about the future? We've heard a lot about climate change and the consequences of more intense storm events, and that does have an impact in terms of what the products can actually have. We've seen in some trial work we've done in Rotorua, hydrophobic soils where you can lose 90% of the phosphorus that you actually put on with poor timing. So the consequence uh, of these sorts of changes that are coming forward are quite important. I mentioned yesterday our product inventory lead times, four months to six months depending on the product. So if we're going to get drought periods, it has quite important implications for us as a business. Our nitrogen stewardship is under challenge. So we have to be very careful how we manage the stewardship of that product to retain the rights of that. And given <coughs> uh, the DAP uh, issues um, uh, in terms of water quality, phosphate stewardship is something else that we're going to have to focus on as well in terms of water quality. And finally, an acceptable nitrification inhibitor. DCD is not coming back. Is there an inhibitor that's out there that we can actually do? And finally, just the often colloquial conversation is, will we run out of fertiliser? Uh, no, we won't. You know, there's over three to 400 years. The only way we'll be constrained in terms of phosphorus is if geopolitics. But the more important element is sulphur. 50% of our sulphur comes from the fossil fuel industry. So as the world decarbonises, what does that mean to sulphur supply? And perhaps our industry may be more reflected less as a phosphate industry to as a sulphur industry going forward. Thank you.